Hello, I'm Marion Hughes with Pounds Labs and Nation's Photo Labs, and today I want to share with you the dirty little secrets of digital photography. I do want to make one point at the very beginning. The key is consistency. We can all be a good photographer and take several hundred photographs to get just a handful. But consistency requires that we understand our equipment and understand its shortcomings as well as its strengths. Today we're going to show you how to find the shortcomings and get around their problems. Don't trust the seat of your pants. The view screen on your camera is highly unreliable. It's totally dependent on whether or not you're on outside, inside, it's bright, it's dark, and uh, your perception of what it looks like. You can't judge by the screen on the camera. Histograms can be tricky. And that's because when you view a histogram, you're basically setting your camera on automatic. Even though you're on manual, if you adjust to a histogram of an average scene, it's the same thing as if you'd set your camera to some kind of automatic like AV or TV. So let's not do that. Equipment must be tuned to be accurate. If you're going to use a meter or any other piece of equipment, it needs to be right for that camera and that lens. We'll show you more about that in a little bit too. Preset white balances are never exact. They will get you in the ballpark, but you still have to work to correct them. And our total goal on this presentation is to get it right in the camera. Auto anything makes auto mistakes for you. Don't give your brain over to the camera because it's not as smart as you are. Shooting raw means a lot of Photoshop time. Some people say, oh, I'll shoot raw and we'll fix anything. Well, it doesn't really fix anything. There are limitations to raw. Plus, if you're shooting volume photography and you're taking 500 images today and you need to touch each one of them to make sure they're perfect, imagine how much time that would take you to get a job ready for production. Because let's face it, anytime you take something into Photoshop, Photoshop is an adult video game. We end up playing in it way too much in our business. And again, we're going to help you to get it right the first time and every time. Remember the show Price is Right? I think it's still playing. One of the key games on that show had a motto of guess the price, get as close as you can without going over. Well, that motto applies to photography exposure as well. In the film days, you could be in the ballpark and still be able to print the photograph. I've seen pictures printed from three stops over that weren't great, but at least were uh, at least printable. In the digital world, third of a stop over is too much. A full stop under can be recovered. Your best, stop, best bet is to be perfect. Now you might say, I'm not perfect. I'm going to show you ways you can be. Here is a perfectly exposed image of a young man. It's got great detail in the shadows, great detail in the highlights. When it's printed by the lab, it goes to the lab like snot through a snail. No corrections necessary. And you didn't need to touch it before you sent it in. Here we have a similar image underexposed by a stop. Now, it can be corrected, but once you correct it, it's very hard to get it to look like an original exposure. This correction right here, the blacks in the picture go a little bit hazy. The skin tone becomes flat, doesn't have any spark to it. This is especially a challenge when you're photographing African-American subjects as you need to gather detail in the shadows to a much greater degree. But overexposure. Overexposure is one of the two devils of digital photography. In this case, it was overexposed by a full stop. When it was corrected back to as close to normal as possible, notice the contrast is high. The yellow shirt the child's wearing is white now, and it'll never be yellow. If you printed it down and tried to make it yellow, his face would be, in, be totally orange. And the face is already on the warm side. And look at the highlights. Look at the, the shine on his cheeks and forehead. Those are due to the fact that when the picture is overexposed, you step out of the red range of 255. It's topped out. So that means that everything you do is going to be contrasty and reddish. Get as close to the correct exposure as possible without going over. 
Consistency requires that we know the variables. And that's what we're going to look at now, the variables that are in our business. First off, your studio strobes are out to get you. We uh, take it for granted that when we turn them on, the exposure is going to be the same now and an hour from now. We expect that the color is going to be consistent. Two big mistakes. There are two general types of strobe, analog and digital. We're going to discuss them both. Analog strobes have been around for a while. They're like the Alien B and the White Lightning and many others. Digital strobes, like the Calumet Genesis, Paul Bose Einstein, and many, many others. On digital strobes, the power is adjustable to a more precise level. You can turn it up and down by tenths of a stop. They generally maintain color better than, than uh, analog strobes, but it's possible that the trade-off for getting that color is that they'll blur action. The flash duration, believe it or not, when you turn a digital strobe down to a low power, or many digital strobes down to low power, the flash duration becomes longer. Because it becomes longer, it makes, makes for blurry images. Analog strobes, like I said before, very simple, been around for a while, you may have some already. They're much cheaper and simpler to operate. They can shift color, but then a few of the digital ones can too. They do require warm-up time. I don't care who makes the strobe, you've got to warm it up. You need to know your strobes, so you should test your strobes. And in a few moments, we'll go over a test that you can do to tell you if your strobes are performing to their optimal. Analogs brighten during their first hour of use as they warm up. So in order to use them correctly and not have them brighten enough to be a problem by the end of your shoot, give them a reasonable warm-up time. I like to say 30 minutes, but in reality, you don't always have 30 minutes. So I'm going to show you how to get it warmed up quickly. When I get to the school or to the site, I'll plug my strobes in, I'll turn them on to full power, and I'll walk off and set up my outfit, put up my background, put up my camera, all the things necessary, and then I'll go back to my strobes. I'll unplug them and put them in the set. At that point, before I meter those lights, I'm going to fire them 30 times. That's 30 times, 5 seconds apart. And here's the reason why. <clears throat> that warms and for, warms up and formats, I believe the term is, yeah, formats the, uh, the capacitors, forms the capacitors, my mistake. Now, once the capacitors are formed, they're not likely to get bright during the shoot. Why five second intervals? And I think, oh, so they'll recycle. Remember, this is at full power. You're taking a lot of power out of the, system, out of the electricity every time you fire them. If you fire more often than every five seconds, it's very likely that you're going to blow a circuit breaker somewhere. Test my meet Now, here's how you test to see if your strobes really warm up or not. You test by metering at power up, and then again after they've warmed up and been fired 30 times. Analogs may be inconsistent at low powers. In fact, they generally are. If you get down to eighth power, you have a problem. To test that, you can warm up your strobes, then take 30 images at eighth power, five seconds apart. Bring those images up on your computer so you see them all at once, and if there's a variance in the exposures, you'll quickly see it. That indicates that that strobe is not maintaining its exposure at that low uh, power ratio. You can repeat the test at quarter power, and it'll probably straighten out. What I do is make sure that all my setups with my lights are never below quarter power. Analogs may color shift between low and high power. Now this is a quick test to determine that, but just take my word for it. At low power, they turn red. White balance at eighth power. Take a full power image and then compare the color. In other words, white balance at eighth power, keep that image. Recalculate your exposure for full power and take another, and you may see a difference in the color. Posted sync speeds are for on-camera flash. 
the posted sync speed on your camera is probably a 250th of a second. And that's great if you're using the little pop-up strobe that comes with the camera or you're using a, an attachable strobe that hooks into the hot shoe. Once you go to studio strobes or start using remote uh, sync supplies or going to uh, long sync cords, the sync speed goes down. You need to test to find out the best speed, sync speed for your equipment. Now this test is quick and simple. You shoot a white wall at a 60th of a second and then all the way up one shutter speed at a time to a 400th of a second. You'll end up with a set of images. Now notice on this one at a 320th of a second, of course it didn't sync. It wasn't supposed to. But I'm using studio strobes here. Remember their flash duration is longer. At a 250th of a second, I still have some failure to sync. And that's somewhat erratic. Sometimes I'll have more and sometimes I'll have less. At a 250th of a second, it seems to be all the way across, but it's a little darker than at a 160. 160 and 125 appear to be about the same. You can save yourself this test if your equipment's not really, really old and just simply shoot all of your studio work at 125th of a second. Run this test if you've used your camera for many years because this problem generally gets worse the more clicks on the shutter. Now, all cameras are not created equal. They're endowed by their creators <laughs> with a possibility of being overexposed or underexposed a third of a stop from ideal. And that's because they just simply can't make the sensors any more accurate than that without costing a whole bunch of money and sticking the name Leica on it. So two cameras coming, I don't care from Canon, Nikon, Sony, whoever, come out of the factory with the same model and the serial number off by one, one could be a third of a stop brighter and the other one could be a third of a stop darker than normal or a two thirds of a stop difference. And the bad news is your lenses are in the same shape. They can't make them perfect. So as long as they're within a third of a stop either way, they consider it okay. Now this means that you can set up with a camera, with several cameras in a school and if you use a meter on each one, they're gonna give you different exposures but you want them to be the same. So let's talk about how to do that. Meters must be tuned to the camera and lens that they're going to be used with. Now some meters cannot be tuned, others can. There's also a method of getting exposure that doesn't require a meter at all that we'll share with you. Tuning your meter to the camera and lens First, you've got to have a calibration target. This is the empirical standard where you can tell if an exposure is perfect or not. Three of the most popular are Munzel's Color Checker. It's probably the very best one ever made. Excellent material, won't change over time. Ed Pierce's calibration target's also available. And if you're a Pounds Labs customer, you can get the white balance exposure target for us for only about $25. It's called the Wibbit. It's very practical, very easy to use. This is what the Wibbit looks like. It's in a closed container so it doesn't get scarred up. It only has black and a certain level of white. To use it, place it in position exactly where you want your subject to be and preset the camera to the f-stop you want the light to be. We'll say f8. Photograph just the center white area and a little bit of the black around it. When you do that, you're going to have a histogram on the back of the camera that with the Wibbit only has two, uh, two spikes. One of the others will have three. Always ignore the center spike. It's not right for digital. And look at only the outer edges. When the left spike, representing the dark tones, is the same distance from the edge of the frame as the white spike is on the right, the exposure is perfect. Those two spikes move together like prongs on a fork. So as the exposure goes down, they move to the left. If the exposure is too high, they move to the right. And it's very easy to see if it's accurate. If you can't tell if it's right, it's within a tenth of a stop. So use only the, the dark tone and the light tone and keep, them, keep the distance between the spikes and the edge of the histogram the same. Again, you want to tune your meter to match the exposure that you acquired 
with your calibration target. So we're going to examine the histogram and we're going to change our power till it's perfect. Let's say we were shooting for F16. And we get F16 on the camera by looking at the spikes and making them even. Now we meter with our meter that same site. If the meter reads like 16.6, you know that it's not right. It's got to read 16.0. If it reads 11.5, you know it's not right. It needs to read 16.0. So you'll adjust the meter up and down with the controls uh, built into it until it reads exactly what your camera did. Now you've got a meter that is tuned to match that camera. Now, the bad part of that is it won't be tuned to match every other camera you own. And if you're using a situation where you have four or five cameras in the same school and they're all trying to get the same exposure, this may not be the method to use. One way around this and to retire all of your meters forever is to get a copy of the Wibbit or one of the other calibration targets. And then when you want a particular light to be a certain exposure, set your camera to that exposure, photograph the target and adjust that light until the exposure is correct. For example, if you want your fill light to be F8, set the camera to F8 with only the fill light, not the uh, fill in the main, and adjust the exposure until you get a histogram that shows perfect exposure at F8. Then what I do is turn on the main light and the fill light together, and if say I want to get a ratio of a little bit more than one to two, I'll get the fill and main together to read F9. So I'll set the camera to F9. I'll turn the main up and down until I get perfect spikes. This way, I never needed a meter in the first place. Another aspect that we expect to be correct when we take our camera out of the box is focusing. We assume that if we use the focusing point and we focus on a certain point, that that best point will be sharp. And often it is, but we don't know that for a fact. In fact, each camera and lens combination need to be tested. Let's show you the test. The focusing target is available from Pounds Labs. By just requesting it, you can send me an email at marion at poundslabs.com, and that will be repeated at the end of this tape. And as for the focusing target, I'll send you a PDF that you can have printed, and uh, this works out very well. To let you know exactly how accurate or inaccurate your camera is. What you do is you lay this target flat on a table, pop up the little strobe on the top of your camera. If you don't have one, put a shoe mount strobe on it. Set the camera to f5.6. Now, with it laying at an angle, you're shooting from the big numbers to the little numbers. You're focusing carefully on that black spot in the very center and you take a picture. Then you look at that image on the back of the camera. You enlarge it and see if the place where you focused is the place that's sharp. Notice here, zero is not the sharpest point. It's actually sharpest around plus two. You can see that behind zero is softer than it is in front of zero. This tells me that this lens and this camera, if that zoom position is front focusing. Now you do this, it says here at all three, at three different zoom ranges, I would do it at each marked zoom range on your zoom lens so that you'll know exactly where it focuses each time. If you have a newer camera and it consistently focuses behind or in front, you can probably tune it to correct this problem. Often I see where a camera will focus beautifully at telephoto and mid-range, but at wide angle it's way off, usually front focused. And people don't discover this until they go out to shoot a scene, a scenery or a group and they can't figure out why their camera that works so well the other time is soft wide angle. This is an important test to run. All cameras again are not created equal. We want to custom white balance the cameras, not, not use a preset. To custom white balance, you can use the same target that you got the exposure with. You get that exposure perfect. Once it's 100% perfect, then you white balance twice. Yes, I said twice. The first time you white balance corrects the color 85 to 90 percent of the way. But if the last time you used the camera was in a gym under mercury vapor lights and you tried to balance to that, then the difference between that and the strobe you're using today is huge. So one white balance won't be sufficient. White balance, then photograph the target and white balance again to get perfect color. This is another way that you can have four cameras in a room and all of them give you exactly the same results. Dust the bane of our existence. First advice, don't take the lens off your camera. 
Put a lens on the camera that's the one you're going to use primarily and leave it on all the time. Do not take it off to put it in the case just because it fits better. Because every time you take the lens off, your sensor acts like a vacuum cleaner and through static electricity tries to get every piece of dust in your case right into the chamber with it. So it's important that when you're dealing with a camera, you try to leave the lens on it all the time. When you do change lenses, try to change them blocking the wind away from you, point the body of the camera downward, and then quickly change the lens. Dust contamination can be detected and corrected and prevented. Change the lens only when truly necessary. Okay, you want to have the correct setting on your camera for auto cleaning. You want it to auto clean every time you turn it on and turn it off. But auto cleaning, auto cleaning uses a technique to try to remove the dust by shaking and vibrating the sensor. Then hopefully the dust will come free, sink down to a piece of tape below the sensor at the bottom of the camera and stick there. If you're trying to clean it by turning it on and off, activating the auto cleaning method, me mechanism to get the most accurate use of that, have the camera level and still so that again the dust can settle and not come back up and haunt you again. The uh, sky test for dust. This is a simple one. You just simply go outside, set your camera to f22, adjust the shutter until a picture of the sky looks blue. Not overexposed, not way underexposed. And then at f22 and completely out of focus, you don't want it in focus because a bird flying by might be mistaken for butt dust. But completely out of focus, you photograph that clear sky. Now enlarge the view on the back of the camera five clicks and then drive around the image looking for dust. Dust will be the only thing moving. Now when it comes time to cleaning dust, if you're going to use swabs, be prepared to buy a new camera or a new sensor. Now, it doesn't mean that swabs can't be used. I use them myself. But if you make a mistake with them, it's a costly mistake. The best tool for cleaning dust off your, off your sensor is a rocket, rocket puffer. What I do is I go into the restroom where showers are done and they pull dust out of the air. So that's the cleanest room in the house, hopefully. Then I remove the lens and I hold the body of the camera downward and I open the shutter and I puff the sensor. Puff it, puff it, puff it, and put the lens back on and test it again. This way I can get the dust off, and in most cases I do not have to use a swab. Umbrellas and soft boxes. They have two totally different functions. Let's, let's look at them. Soft boxes are like shotguns. They throw the light forward. They throw the light forward and they don't throw it around the room a lot. So they're really handy when you want to light something and not light anything around it. For example, in this case, uh, we're lighting the subject and we're using a background light and the background light is going to be adjusted by turning, by using a colored filter so I can color it. Well, I can get a good saturated color, but only because I'm using a softbox and keeping most of the light off the background. But what if I want to do green screen? Well, umbrellas are like bombs. They throw light all around the room. And that's very handy when you're doing green screen photography because it can help you to illuminate the background without lighting it separately. It's also true that an umbrella gives you a very pretty light. Uh, remember, well, we'll talk about what kind of umbrella here in just a second. Umbrellas, the silver versus shoot through versus white. We know we already have a problem in digital photography with shine on the faces if there's any overexposure. So why would you want to use an umbrella that intensifies that? You don't want to use a silver umbrella. Silver umbrellas give you a lot of light, but they give you a harsh, contrasty light. The same thing is basically true of satin umbrellas. It's very popular to have a satin umbrella. They focus the light too much and, again, increase the amount of shine that you'll see on the face. I'm not a big fan of shoot-through umbrellas, and that's because what they do is throw most of your light away behind you. A standard white umbrella that's white like paper is your best choice. It gives you a very soft lighting, works very well with digital. Now let's talk about how to aim the umbrella, and this is another dirty little secret that a lot of people don't realize. On the right, we have a strobe where the shaft of the umbrella 
goes through the bottom of the flash. Did you see that? When the flash fires, it primarily eliminates, to a greater degree, the top of the umbrella. The top of the umbrella is tilted downward. So this means that the pattern thrown by the light from this umbrella is not straight down the shaft, but down a little bit. So if I'm using a light source that goes underneath, that the shaft of the umbrella goes underneath the light, I will always keep it level to the floor because I know it's going to come down at an angle all by itself. If you aim the shaft at the subject, you're actually lighting a little above the subject. Now let's talk about lights where the shaft goes above the power pack. In this case, the shaft mounts above the flash unit, so primarily what's getting eliminated? The bottom half of the umbrella is getting most of the light, or a big share of it, which is reflecting the light upward and out. When using this configuration, you want to point the shaft below the subject. If I'm doing a head and shoulders portrait, I'll point that shaft at their seat and not at their face. Then I'm illuminating the entire area evenly. Viewing the monitor on your camera, outdoors or in, you've got to have a loop. Now, a company called uh, Hoodman sells some very nice loops, but for about five bucks you can do this. Go down to any camera store that's been around since the film days, and they're going to have a shelf full of these little loops. And uh, they can't sell them because nobody's looking at negatives anymore. You buy one of those, and you cover the clear area with black tape. Now you basically have a little tunnel that you can look through. You place this loop on the, your monitor when you want to see what you've done, and you're seeing a much more realistic view of the monitor. You're not, you're not getting glare that's throwing you off. So, definitely want to get a loop. Okay, last thing we're going to cover is crop points on the human body. Very basic information, pass it on at no extra charge. Okay, when you take a portrait, if we're talking volume photography, you generally want to have consistent head sizes. In a school, a yearbook would look kind of funny if one head was big and the next one was small and vice versa. So, there, you can get a crop mass for your camera that works for all types of photography, be it volume, be it sports, be it wedding, doesn't matter. This particular one has a line for the top of the head and a line for the chin. Now I can get all the heads the same size. The line at the bottom is for full length. That would be the toe position. The long line at the bottom and the top are the areas that would be cropped out of an 8x10. Primarily I want to shoot everything as if it was going to be printed 8x10. And that way, if I crop to 5 by 7 I'm not making the heads bigger or smaller. So this tells me exactly where an 8 by 10 is going to fit. Now let's say you're photographing a group outside or at a wedding. The same lines that were the hairline and the toe line before are now the shoulders of your group. Now your group will fit perfectly in an 8 by 10 format. The company that makes this mask is viewfindermask.com. And their phone number is here. It is 949-573-5339. Ask for, you can ask for the Marion mask or ask for the straight line mask. This is the easiest one to work with. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to email me. My email is shown here is Marion at pounds labs.com. That's pounds with an S, labs with an S. And again, looking forward to talking to you. I hope this information was helpful.